This is a parent kiddo version of praying in the name of our Heavenly Father. So I want to talk about that in this video. In counterfeit Christianity, and counterfeit just means fake. It just means false. In counterfeit Christianity, people do a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> they do a lot of weird stuff. And you might have seen them do some weird stuff like scream the name of Jesus over their situations. And you might have even looked at that and thought, I don't know what that's all about. And it probably didn't feel right to you because usually kids know when stuff is not right, when it doesn't feel good. In the New Testament, after Jesus died, the apostles would heal people and they would say, in the name of Jesus, I heal you in the name of Jesus. Or they might have driven out a spirit and said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And the reason they were doing that is because they were revealing the glory of God. They were letting the people know we're performing these signs and wonders so that you know that Jesus was God's Christ and that this is the Messiah we have that we have been waiting for for many years that our ancestors were waiting for and had been promised for many years. And in the Bible, God says things like when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, remember when he parted the Red Sea and he led the Israelites through dry land across the sea and then when their enemies were chasing them, he closed up the sea real quick and and as he says, he snuffed them out like a wick. When you're snuffing something out like a wick, you're you're kind of taking away the oxygen from the fire on a candle. And so it just, that light just goes out. And that's what he did with the enemies of the Israelites. And when God did that, he said to the people, you saw how I carried you on eagle's wings out of Egypt. Like you've seen the things that I've done. And he says something really interesting. He says, you saw that I made a name for myself. What does that mean, guys? Does that mean like if someone said that to you, would you say, well, what is your name? No, you would know that they were saying that I made a reputation for myself, that I am showing you who I am. I revealed my glory. I revealed that I am sovereign, that I performed all these miracles and that I am your God. And it just so happens that all throughout the Bible, God says that. He says, you're going to know who I am. Then you're going to know. I'm going to do all these things. And then you're going to know that I am the Lord, that I am God, that I am sovereign, that I am the one who does all these things. So that's the name. It's who God is. And it's his reputation. And it's what he's doing now. It's who he's been. And it's who he's being revealed to be. You may have heard people refer to God in all different um, names. You might have heard them say El Shaddai or Yahweh, all different kinds of names, right? Well, we're going to read Exodus 3 right now. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because their slave driver of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. 
So go now. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. That's kind of a funny name. Okay, well, let's look at what this name means. So he's, so God said to Moses, I am, that's his name. And this is the name that we are to call him from generation to generation. Now in verse 14, there's a little footnote and it says, or I will be what I will be. And the reason it says that is because as we go over to, we're going to go to a, what's called a concordance. It's called Strong's. But when you look up the name of God, it's the word Haya. And that word not only means I am who I am, but it also means I will be what I will be. What does that mean? Think about that for a minute. I am who I am and I will be what I will be. Well, there's other language that God uses in the word in scripture where he says, I am the beginning and the end. I am the alpha and the omega and that he is being revealed. So he was, there was no God before him. He was, he is, and he is to come. So he's all of these things. He was before the earth was even made. There's never been a God before him and there'll never be one after him. This is the name. This is the name of God. So is the name of God Haya? Like, is that, okay, so do we call him Haya? Sure, we can call him Haya. But one of the things that have happened that people have done is they've said, Haya is a verb. And I don't know if you've learned about verbs yet, but a verb means an action word. Now, my name's Carrie. My name's Carrie Ann. Is Carrie Ann an action word? No. Carrie Ann is just a name and it's called a proper noun. So it's just, well, that's my name. But God doesn't have to be. He stated his name as an action word, actually. Haya is an action word. And so that means that it's moving. That's kind of a funny way to think, huh? Like that someone's name could be moving. But there's always something being revealed in who he is, who he was, who he is, and who he is becoming. He was, he is, he is to come. He's continuing to always be revealed. But there are some people who decided that they didn't like that God stated his name as a verb. And instead of trying to understand what God was saying, they decided, well, we're human beings and we're super important. So we're going to change his name to a proper noun. What's the proper noun of Hayat? Yahweh. So they go around calling him Yahweh. That's how that came to be. But it's not correct. Yahweh is not the name that God stated. It's not the name that he gave himself. God wanted us to understand that he's always being revealed and that he doesn't have to go by human rules. Now, is it going to change something for you to refer to him as Haya versus God versus, you know, a list of names? Not really. What should be changing is the understanding that you have in your heart of who he is. So, for example, when I refer to God as Haya, when I use that name, it reminds me, like I stop and I think about what I'm saying. I think about, I'm stating right now what God's name is, and I am reminding myself in my heart that this, that God is, he was, and he is to come, that there's no God before him. 
There won't be one after him. He's the alpha and omega. He's the beginning and the end. And that he is doing something in his name all the time. What is he doing in his name? Well, he has, he talks about the kingdom of heaven and what he's doing in that kingdom. He talks about us as a family and what he's doing with us, how he's raising us, how he's purifying us, that he's the potter and we're the clay and he's making us into different tools and vessels for various uses. When you're praying in the name of God, you're not screaming out, Hiya! Or Jesus! In the name of Jesus! You're not doing that. People who do that don't know what they're doing. And if they had any sense at all, they would realize that just screaming out a name doesn't change anything. Like, they should have figured that out by now. They do not understand what the apostles were doing. The apostles were letting people know I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. And so when you see this miracle happen, so that you will go and give glory to God, you'll go praise God and you'll acknowledge that his son is Jesus Christ. That's why they were saying in the name of Jesus. So what you're doing when you pray in God's name is that you're praying in his will. You're praying in the desire of God. So when you pray, you have to make sure that what you're praying for actually is what God wants. Do we then say, well, God, I really want you to want what I want and to get me this toy. So in your name, I'm going to pray for this toy. No, we don't do that. When we're asking God for something, we need to make sure that it's something that he wants. And if there if there's something that we want, then we want to we want to take this position. Well, heavenly Father, I really do want this toy. But I also know that it's important for me to pray about what you want, but if you're willing and if it pleases you and you think it's a good idea and if I have won your favor, like if I have made you proud and you're happy with me and you think this is a good idea, will you please make a way for me to have this toy? And if not, then I accept whatever your will is. That is also praying in his name because God wants to give you good things, but you also have to be in the right position and you got to ask with the right motives. The other way and the most important way to pray in God's name is to cause our heart to become like God's heart. So that's most important, is that what we're praying for is for him, is for what he wants. And when we're praying for what he wants, it'd be kind of silly for him not to give that to us, right? Of course he's going to give you that. But see, part of praying in God's name, when he says that anything that we ask in his name, that he will give to us, What he's saying is that it's his will to do those things. It's his will for us to rend our heart. That means for us to turn our heart towards him, his, and what he desires. So for example, if you have someone in your family who doesn't believe in God, and you really want for them to know God, you want them to be able to see the glory of God, you can't force that person to accept it. You can't force them to be saved or to want salvation. Only God knows who he's chosen, but you can pray and ask God to reveal himself to them. You can pray for them to be brought into a position where they can know him and he will actually do it. He will reveal himself to them, but only those who God has chosen ahead of time are going to respond to him. And the way we know that is whether they respond to him. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and they listen to me and they follow me and they don't follow strangers. So we always want to be respectful of what it is that God has chosen. And remember that even Jesus, especially Jesus, really, that he was respectful of what God, what the father had already preordained. So when Jesus, for example, was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested, he asked the Father to take away 
this cup from him. That if, is there any other way? You can do anything. If this is not your, if this is your will, then I will accept it. But you can do anything. So if there's any other way, please take this from me. And the father didn't. He didn't take it. it that was what was necessary in the father's will, in, in what he knew was good for Jesus to be that sacrifice for all of us in order for us to be saved. So it's always important that we're, every time we're praying, that we're really trying to understand what is it that God would want in this situation and to pray for that. There's someone in my life who I've prayed for a lot and God has revealed himself over and over to this person, but they've not accepted him. They've seen glimpses of God. They've seen what he's done and they still deny. They still say things like, I'm not sure. I don't stop praying for them. I keep praying for that person and I keep asking God, if it's your will for that person to be saved, please Bring them into a position to really know who you are and to know that you're real. And always, if that's your will. Now, here's another way that it's important to pray. Because if you know God and you have a desire to know him, then God has said that if you ask for wisdom and understanding, he will give to you freely without finding fault, which means he's not going to, he's not going to, think, oh, you're asking for too much wisdom, right? You're just asking for too much. He is not going to find fault. He will give you wisdom. If you truly want good, godly wisdom that is the truth, not like the wisdom of the world, which people, you know, they're like the important people in the world. Who cares about all that? That's going to perish with them. I'm talking about true godly wisdom to know his word, to know his law, to know his truth. He will give you that. He will build understanding in you that only he can build. That's a really good way to pray in God's name. Because again, what is God's name? It's not a word. It's not like, I mean, Haya, of course, we want to be reverent about the name that he used. But the name is really the meaning in the name. It's what he's doing. It's what he stands for. It's who he's established. It's who he was, who he is, and who he's being revealed to be. So if you're praying in that, then you're praying really in the will of the Father. Is it the Father's will to give you wisdom, to help you to know him, the truth, and how to serve him, to give you courage to speak bold truth? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's how you pray in God's name. So make it a practice this week, maybe even sitting down and writing your prayers to God, because sometimes that will really slow you down to really think about like, what is it that God would want? What does he want from me? And how can I pray in that? And even ask him, how do I pray in your name? Can you help me? to pray truly in your name and to know what you want and to strive for what you want. And then you got to believe that he will do that because he will. I know that he will. And do that with your family. Do that with your brothers and sisters and your parents. And let's see what God does this week. And then you can have your parents post on here, post your testimony, or you can come to Sabbath and share your testimony about how that went. I can't wait to hear about it. And as always, ask God if what I say is true.